Hello everyone, I'm Chinmay, and in the third video of the series, we'll be talking about how to annotate and refine the CDS coordinates. But I kind of need to share my screen to do that, so let's just do that real quick. In the previous video, we talked about the project details table, how to fill out the gene report form with a symphony table, as well as how to get these images. Today, we're going to be talking about how to fill out the CDS report form as well as the CDS report form for each isoform. But, so let's just start off with the coding sequence report form. And to do that, we need to go to the gene record finder. So once we're here, we can just type in the name of the gene. Remember that the name of the gene is always going to be case sensitive. We also need to pull up the genome browser for our target species. So we can just go here, select our species, and type in pull one and it should pop up in one of these options. There we go. In the previous video, we talked about how to confirm that our gene is actually in this position. But before we do that, we just need to know how many isoforms are present in melanogaster first. And what an isoform is, is a different version of the mRNA sequence for the exact same gene. And the number of isoforms in melanogaster are always going to be the number of models shown in this table or they can be the number of models shown in this table. They're both the same. So in this case, skull one has isoforms A, B, C, and D. So we type in there four isoforms. The number of isoforms in the target species should usually be similar to melanogaster, but sometimes they might not be. In this case, since all of them have the same coding sequence, and since there's no way to tell in our target species the difference between isoforms in terms of the mRNA or UTRs, we would say yes, all four isoforms do exist in our target species. And now we need to fill this table out. And what this is essentially the isoforms of unique coding isoforms table from the gene record finder. And what this table is asking is to name the unique isoforms in melanogaster based on coding sequence. There's two tabs in gene record find the transcript details and the polypeptides. The polypeptides or the proteins tab tells us about the protein coding isoforms, which is what we're looking for in this case. And the transcript details table tells us about the transcripts. And the reason that there's no unique based on CDS or, or similar isoforms in the transcript details table is because the way we define isoforms is by different exons. And that's what these are. These are UTR exons or untranslated regions. And because they are different, therefore, they are different isoforms. And because they all share the same coding sequence, they all have the similar coding sequence or identical coding sequence. So I'm going to copy this and paste it in here. As always, keep text only. And then you can copy the similar isoforms, paste them in here, and keep text only. If you have multiple isoforms that are all the same, instead of call one, PB, PC, PA, whatever, you can just say PA, PD, and PC. It's okay, we understand what you're talking about. And now to select if the coding isoform is present in the target species. If we look back to Erecta, we can see that there is decent rna data to support the presence of call one in Erecta. So we just say, yes, it's likely present in our target species, and we can just select it. If you don't have any other unique coding isoforms, you can just leave this, don't worry about it. The next thing asks us if there's strong evidence for additional protein coding isoforms. In this case, what I do is I try to see if there seems to be a splice site or a potential new isoform. Since it doesn't seem to be, I'm going to say no and leave the rest the way it is. The next section asks us to find out if there's missing CDS isoforms that are present in melanogaster, but not present here. Since that's not the case, I'm just gonna select no. If you had more than one protein coding isoform, what you would do is you'd copy this whole section all the way to the end of this empty page, and you would copy and paste it the number of times you have a unique coding isoform. And I would suggest doing that at the start so that they're empty and so you don't get confused as to which coordinates belong to which isoform. Since skull one doesn't have that, I'm not going to copy it. 
this first part asks us to type in the name of the isoform, which is going to be PC in this case. Always use the thing that's on the left. Don't use A, B, or D because they're on the right. Just use PC because that's what we standardized as. So you just need to type in PC. You can type in the whole name, but since the whole document is going to be for colon one, you don't need to mention colon one. You can just say PC. I'd also suggest keeping those brackets just so it's easy to visualize what part of that title is the ice form name. We can't stop annotating right out of the box. We first need to figure out approximately where the exons are. And to do that, we need to head to blast. And we just need to head to the normal general blast, not a species or assembly specific one, because we, we're going to be providing our own database to blast against. And to do that, we need to click on the Align to a More Sequences checkbox. We already found out where our scaffold session number is in the first part of this document. So it's going to be the CH blah blah blah. And we're going to take that CH session number and paste it as our subject sequence. Now we need to blast our exon sequence against the scaffold. There's two primary ways to do that. The first way is to take your first exon, take the sequence, copy and paste it in the query sequence, blast it, and then you have to do that two more times because call one has three exons. There's a more expedient way to do it, and that is by clicking the export all CDS for selected isoform, copy the entire thing, and paste that as your query. And remember, do not delete the headers this time, because this time we require it to be three individual sequences. So if we click the job title, it says three sequences, and the name of the very first sequence that pops up. We also need to change the algorithm parameters slightly. So click on the plus button, go down to compositional adjustments and click no adjustment. You also need to unfilter the low complexity regions. I'm going to select a view the results in a new tab and blast it and wait. Oh great, so now this is telling us that there is an issue. And what, what's the issue? It says please reduce your query or subject to 10 million bases or less. We know for sure that our gene is less than 10 million bases, right? Therefore, our issue should be in the scaffold. And to fix it, we need to edit the subject subrange a little bit. To do that, we need to go to the approximate region of our target species in our target assembly, which is going to be Erecta. And I'm going to zoom out slightly just so we have a little more to work with. And I'm going to take the coordinates up there and paste them in blast. So I'm going to take the 18 million, 8, 15,000 something, paste it to from, and the other coordinate I'm going to paste into two. So whenever you put in numbers into blast, just make sure you exclude the commas because blast doesn't like that. So after you remove the commas, we can just blast it and wait. Great, that was quick. So now we have the match of the first axon, but we can easily switch to axon two or three. But for the first axon, we have one blast hit. Now this blast hit is on the negative two frame and goes from here to approximately here. So now I can take my start code, copy it, go back to my annotation report form, go to the section that reports the coordinates and paste it in start. I'm also going to do the exact same thing for the stop coordinates. So copy it and paste it in there. And as always, keep text only. So that's our first exon. And it's important to note that all these coordinates are temporary and will be changed once we start our refinement process. That being said, let's move to the second exon. To do that, just click on this drop down and select exon 2. And since there's only one match anyways, we can do the exact same thing. We can go in here, copy the start, paste it in here and keep text only, copy the end, paste it in the annotation report form, keep text only. And we do the exact same thing for the third exon. Now, despite us quote unquote finishing, there's much more work to be done because we can't be sure that these are the correct coordinates for each of the three exons. 
because what DLUST N is doing is it's only matching a protein against the protein portion of a nucleotide sequence. So what it's doing is it's losing some resolution. So if we go back to the intron exon boundary in our gene, in our target species, and zoom in, what it's doing is it's blasting the V but not the P. So that C and T base, we're losing that amount of resolution which we need. Therefore, we need to refine the coordinates, and this is how we do it. Take the coordinates of your first exon, copy them, go back to your genome browser, and along with the scaffold name, just paste your coordinate there and hit go. So now this is the approximate region of your first exon. And because it's the first exon and on the negative strand, I would suggest clicking on the reverse button down here. If, however, you're on the positive strand, you don't need to worry about it. The reverse button flips the strand and moves everything from left to right like you're used to. Our first exon should always start with inclinine. It must start with inclinine. So we go to the left, and because that's where it starts, and this is where the NCBRF seq prediction is. So we zoom into that region. And there's a methionine. To find the start of the methionine, we need to look at the coordinate of the A in the codon, the ADG codon. So let's zoom in. And the coordinate is 1, 8, 8, 2, 1, 8, 2, 8. So if we go back, we can see it's the same. So in this case, it's good. And the reading frame is minus 2. Now we need to zoom back out and go to the other end of the exon, so 3 prime end of the exon, to see how it ends, specifically what the phase donor is. And what a splice junction is, essentially removes the intron from the mRNA sequence. And it does that using canonical sequence, which are going to be GT as a donor and AC as an acceptor. So in this case, we have that GT donor. And because we're in reading frame 2, we end at phase 0. And what phase means is essentially the number of bases in an incomplete codon before that codon splits into an intron. So in this case, it's 0. Therefore, that 820953 is the last coordinate of the very first exon. And the donor phase is 0. So in this case, it's 820953. In this case, it worked out. Usually, it does not work out. And the donor phase is zero. The donor phase of one exon and the acceptor of the very next exon are very much paired or linked. If you add them, they should either sum to zero or three. So in this case, we're going to say zero because zero plus zero is zero. So we need to still confirm that. So we need to copy these coordinates of the second exon and paste them into our browser. We do the same thing as before, just remove that, paste, and hit go. And again, we go to the start. And if we remember, based on BLAST, it said our coding exon 2 should be in reading frame minus 3. Right? So we expect it to be minus 3 as well. Right? And that's what these reading frames are. It's minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 from top to bottom because in a negative strand. If we were on the positive strand, it'd be plus 1, 2, and 3. So because we expect it to be in minus 3, let's look at minus 3. It says there's those stop codons, which gives us more confidence that that's the actual reading frame. So let's just go to the start of the second exon. If we remember, we're in reading frame minus 3, and we expect a phase of 0. So the donor was GT, and the acceptor should be AG, and our AG is right there, perfect. We also know we should be on phase 0 because the donor of the previous exon was 0. So if we look, we can see that the number of bases in the incomplete codon for us to remain in reading frame minus 3 is 0. So we expect it to end with 891. If we look here, it is 891. That's great. In this case, it worked out. Usually, it does not. But in this case, I got a little lucky. So now we're going to zoom out and zoom back in to the end of the exon to look at the donor phase. Now this donor phase, because we're in range frame plus 3, 
is also going to be zero because zero is the number of bases in an incomplete codon between the exon and the intron, right? So we end in 845 with the donor as a GT. And the reason that we end in this 845 is because the blatt alignments of RefSeq gene ends here, the SP align ends here, which is essentially a blast of the DML proteins, as well as the RNA seq tracks all end at this coordinate. So in this case, because it's 845, we leave it like that and we add phase donor zero and we expect the acceptor of the next exon to be zero. If for some reason it wasn't a phase of zero, we change this to say 846, um, which would make it a phase two. And then the subsequent acceptor phase would be a phase one. In this case, again, I get lucky, but usually you would not see something like this often. But in this case, since I got a little lucky, the phase donor is zero. And when the phase donor is zero, the acceptor of the next exon must also be always zero. There's no other phase acceptor that's possible with a phase donor of zero. So now we need to confirm or refine the CDS coordinates. So we just have to copy all of it, go to our genome browser, paste it, and hit go. There's two ways to find out what reading frame you're in either by looking for the absence of stop codon, so in this case, it's going to be reading frame minus one, or alternatively, we can always go to blast, select the third exon, go to our alignment, and then it says right there, we should be in reading frame minus one. So we expect to have a phase acceptor of zero in reading frame minus one. So after zooming in, we can see our AG splice site, which is canonical, and that puts us at a, phase of zero, the start of the next codon and therefore the next exon in reading frame minus one. So that's where it is. We zoom in to find the coordinate. It says 789, which is the same as what we had before. And now we confirm the five prime min of the exon, we need to confirm the three prime min. So we zoom out and zoom back into the end. And the last coordinate or the last base is going to be the base right before the stop codon. So if we zoom out slightly, we can see that the last codon is GCC, therefore the last base before the stop codon has to be the C, the last C, which is supposed to be 391, but in our annotation report it says 388, which is because the blast alignment also includes a stop codon. But the stop codon is not part of the coding sequence because it technically doesn't code for anything. Right, so we have to change our 388 to a 391. If anything else changes, make sure to change that as well. But in this case, that's not the case. Um, then the donor phase is not applicable because it has nothing to donate to. And now that we've removed the stop codon, we have to add the stop codon back in, which we can do by just looking at the genome browser. So our genome browser says it goes from 390 to 388 because again all the coordinates are inclusive on both ends so including the 390 and including the 388 so now that we've refined the coordinates we need to kind of verify that they are real and to do that we use the gene model checker so we just go to the gene model checker who's link in the description and then we have to add all the information on the left side of the page and now's a good time to purge all the tabs we don't need. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. The first thing it's asking is the species name, which is gonna be Erecta. The next thing is the genome assembly, which is gonna be the agent court assembly, which again is at the top of the annotation report form, which you must have already filled out by now. You should also grab the scaffold name from here, which is gonna be scaffold 4929, which we can put in the gene model checker. So scaffold 4929. And then the orthodox name is going to be cul one pc I would suggest just letting it autocomplete and selecting one of the options below. Then it asks if there's any errors. Usually there's not. In this case, there aren't. If there are, please contact your TAs. Um, and it also asks for the coordinates. So essentially, we can just take those coordinates, paste them in there, and format them properly. What it wants is a comma-separated list. So just put commas in the middle. And that's pretty much it. Then are we translating UTRs? Say no. 
orientation of gene in our case on a negative strand, so minus, and then completeness of gene model is going to be complete because it's not incomplete in our case. And you don't need to type in the stop code on coordinates because if you filled everything else out, it automatically fills. So if you change it to something else, like 90, and then you redo it, it changes, right? So it changes, it goes from um, 8, 9 to whatever else. But we're just going to revert it back because that one was wrong. So we're going to revert it back because these are correct based on our model, based on this document, based on the annotation report form, which goes from 390 to 388. And after we have confirmed that, we can just verify the model. So this is a verified gene model. So it says all pass. If one of the coordinates entered was wrong, most everything is going to fail. And if that's the case, I would suggest looking at the first exon, check if there's wrong coordinates, verify again, look at the next exon and verify again and go downwards from exon one because upstream errors tend to propagate downstream as well. So after you verify the model and everything passes, what the annotation report form wants is a screenshot of the entire gene model checker. So we just go back there and grab the entire thing, including the coordinates, including the checklist. So we just screenshot the whole thing and we click on the image icon and then we select the image we want to import into Word. If it doesn't fill out the entire box, that's fine. Just leave it the way it is. The next part asks for the gene model within the genome browser. Luckily, we don't have to add a model within the genome browser. The gene model checker does that for us directly. So we just need to go there and on the label in the checklist that says number of coding exons, just press the magnifying button. And then that brings us to our gene within the genome browser, right? We also need specific predictions, which are dictated by the annotation report form. So we can just select those and hit refresh. So now we need to get this image, right? We never take screenshots. We have to right click and view as image and then download this image, go back to the annotation report form and select the image from your downloads folder after clicking the pictures icon. The next thing it asks for is the protein alignment between the isoform in your target species versus the same isoform in Melanogaster. To get that, go back to gene model checker, click on dot plot, and we talk about this image specifically a little later. It wants a protein alignment, so just click view protein alignment, and what the annotation report form is asking for is this whole page that pops up. So the only thing you need to do is just click on the download alignment image and you're good to go. And then in the annotation report form, click on the picture icon and select the image and boom. The next thing it asks for is the dot plot. So we go back to the gene model checker and right click on the image, save to downloads and insert it in the annotation report form the way we've been doing it so far. And what the dot plot tells us is it compares the melanogas sequence on the x-axis versus the target sequence in the y-axis. And what it does is if at the particular location of the x versus y, if the amino acid matches, it puts a dot. And because they all match the same, it puts a dot for every point that forms a line, a y is equal to x line. In this specific case, it's a small area, there's no dot even if we zoom in. So this spot at about 200 base pairs doesn't have a dot. So what does that mean? Well, it means at about 200 base pairs, there's a mutation somewhere that changes the protein sequence. And if we go to the protein line again, at about 200 in the rectus sequence, we can see that there is a mutation that creates that gap or shows us that there is a lack of sequence similarity. But in this case, that lack of sequence similarity is too small to change the function of the gene in our target species. After adding the dot plot, we also need to add a brief description of any anomalies if they exist. So in our case, there aren't any major anomalies, so we can just write as such that no major anomalies. Um, and we can also write that a lack of sequence similarity at about 200 amino acids is not enough to imply a change in function in our target species. If you need more space to explain any of these anomalies, you do it on this page in free flow. And that's pretty much it for CDS. 
most of you will not be doing TSS and UGR annotations, so I'm going to skip those for this video. In the next video, we're going to show you how to prepare the project for submission. And to do that, do not change anything in the gene model checker. And I would suggest prepare the project for submission right now so you have all those tabs open. And I'll talk about how to do that in the next video. But until then, stay safe.